baseball tournament this weekend, um, cheering a little excessively. Um, and I, now I sound like a pirate or Batman or something, a combination of both. So I apologize. Okay, Mr. Harley, if you're okay, I'll start with the agenda items first, sir. Absolutely. Uh, number one, we um, we previously talked about this with the committee about increasing our bandwidth uh, for internet to assist us in our synchronous efforts, or if we shut down, um, it's two hundred dollars per month, twenty four hundred dollars more per year, and it doubles our speed. Randy and I talked, and we recommend we approve this expenditure. We think, like as we said before, it's worthwhile as our plan is fragile. Uh, another shutdown could occur, and with the synchronous efforts. Um, being currently planned, it would help us in that and those efforts to get that done and make sure that there's no disruption. Randy or Mike Neal, do you want to speak to that as well about the benefits of that? Um, the, this is Randy. I, I did not get picked uh, for a jury, so so I was home by a little after four. So, um, yeah, the the, the uh, we are looking at, at doubling uh, our bandwidth. Um, the, the, this was a request from a couple other meetings ago. Um, so we looked into it, um, we can still do it. So uh, we have 500 meg per second now. So we actually will have um, one gig of bandwidth or 1000 meg per second. So um, it, it, it makes sense with everything, um, especially if we have to go synchronous. Uh, we, uh, um, along with all the, the, 200, the 200 webcams that we're gonna be passing out, um, it, it makes sense to have that kind of bandwidth, especially directly to the desktop for the hardwired devices. Um. I certainly support this, um, uh, increasing our bandwidth and our capacity so that uh, we don't get bogged down seems to make sense. Um, anybody on the committee object? I think we can move on then, Mike. Okay. Uh, number two, health and safety plan. There's some updates made based on some feedback at the July 28th. Those updates have been made. It's uh, posted to the website and we're ready to go. So we just wanted to focus on a little bit, a couple of clarifications at the building level plans, whatnot. And those changes have been made and it's reposted for everyone to re uh, review, sir. Um, any 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 major changes, Mike? No, the board sent us some feedback. We wanted some changes. So we worked on that and got that done, but nothing major, nothing out of line. If anything, it's more detailed. And it clarifies some things at both the, the large level, but also the building plan level. But nothing big, sir. Do you have any uh, any comments on this? Um, no, I just want to thank everybody who worked on those. Um, I think we're now really clear on what we're doing. Hopefully, answering questions for our families, and also making sure that we're consistent from the document to all the other individual plans. So thank you for everybody who um, worked on those. Oh, absolutely. And Mr. Harley, as you said, everyone had a big role and I appreciate everyone's effort to make that happen. So I'm, I'm pleased to just feel like, you know, it's updated. Did the um, PIAA and the WIPIO, did they make any changes to our, our athletic extracurricular that we need to be aware of? We'll talk about that later on. We have an update with athletics plan that we'll get to it later on in the agenda, if that's okay, there, but there are some changes, yes, sir. Okay, I, I didn't see that. Great. Oh, there it is. Okay. Any objection to moving on? Hearing none. On number three, Mike. Okay. Uh, are you, you asked us to re reach out to us and ask if they could partner up again with us in their health service department to get some of their pre student um, pre service nurses back in our schools to, to fulfill some of their requirements. I talked to our nurses, it makes sense. They would adhere to our same protocols, mass self screening temperature checks. Um, as well as signing in and recording the phone number for contact tracing efforts. But we talked to the nurses, we're gonna need all hands on deck. This makes sense, this gives them a real practical opportunity to get involved with us and understand what's gonna be expected of them in the field and we fully support that. If you click on the link, you can see the partnership and renewal terms. It's a um, pretty standard generic cookie cut agreement, but uh, again, it has our support, sir. Okay, and this is an expansion of what we've had before or is this a new event? No, sir. It's, it's a continuation of what we had before, sir. Okay. Any comments from the committee? Okay. Hearing none, I uh, I'll move this on as a supported item. Number four. Wonderful. Uh, number four, we're, we're required by law by August 14th to have new training in the area of Title IX based on the most recent changes in the legislation. And I'd like to have this committee consider sending a team of 18 of us to go get trained before the August 14th deadline. In this case, it would be de uh, delivered by the Beard Legal Group 
and the Levin, Levine uh, Levin Legal Group. And what they're going to do is work with us at our in our either virtually or in our offices to do a very thorough training in the area of Title One. All administration will be required to attend, as well as the athletic director, safety transportation director, and maintenance director. Again, it makes sense to me. Um, we're required to do it by law, and this allows us to meet that expectation through what I think is the most perfect group to do it, lawyers. And in this case, um, I fully recommend support, and I ask the committee to um, support us as well as we go through this training, if they're okay with it. Committee members, do you have any comment on this? Um, I think it's a really reasonable cost for what you're going to get. Um, and so I suggest, I recommend that we support this. Anyone else? I think, Mike, we can move this ahead. Um, getting uh, getting legal, legal advice on Title IX, which we certainly need for $1,750. Um, that doesn't buy more than three hours of uh, attorney's time. So let's, uh, let's get in line. Okay. Okay, moving on to number five. Yes, sir. Randy, if you could scroll down a little bit. The fifth item of there is pre K enrollment. As a result of the pandemic, we're seeing lower numbers. And the number of people want to take advantage of a pre K program here in the district. Um, our pre K funding is based on enrollment in the program. We're allocated 40 slots, and we currently have 25 filled. By not filling those slots, that means funding will be cut based on a per student allocation. The pre-K guidelines do not restrict the district's enrollment in the pre-K program. So what this means is we're asking you, if we cannot fill our own pre-K slots, are we able to open it up and to outside um, the district to non-resident students for pre-K? If we don't, the money goes back. We could look at losing a position or two, and we don't want to see any of that happen. We think pre-K is invaluable. We think it's worthwhile. So what we're asking the committee to consider is to allow us to um, open it up to non-residents uh, for this year. And again, I think after the pandemic, you'll see a, a, an increase in numbers, but for now, we just don't see it. It could change between now and start of school year, but this is something we want to get in place um, sooner rather than later. Comments on the committee? Board members? Public? I think it's something we should do. Uh, Mike. Yes, sir. My, my question. My question on this, uh, are there other districts within the county or even Apollo Ridge or whatever where we might potentially draw from that also have a pre-K program similar to ours? And yeah. we, Done. do we potentially run afoul of, um, you know, are, are they having the same issues, um, um, you know, that um that sort of thing yeah I'll, jared's on the line he's been he's been the lead for us in rolling that do i think other schools have pre-k program yes is it optional and do they have you know they don't have to come so i don't think we're on a file we're going to work neighborly with everyone and some schools may not have it for those who don't have it and what an option i think it fits their needs pretty well jared anything you want to expand upon that uh, just i mean our, our pre-k program more at East Pike than even at Ben Franklin has struggled to get the enrollment of the, the 20 kids that is allowed. Um, and this year, I would have not expected anything less than to even struggle a little bit more just with everything going on. Um, I have not seen any clear guidance coming out of PD as to whether there's, you know, some type of waiver if you don't hit those 20 kids. So that's why, you know, we're proposing this option is to allow other kids from outside of our district to come um, just in case we do get to the point where we're, our funding is going to be cut because we don't have the full enrollment. Um, what I would recommend is we kind of set a deadline because we are, we, I just got another pre-K application today. So they're still coming in um, slowly for East Pike even. But if we want to set a deadline as to by a certain date we open it up to residents outside of indiana um it's certainly something we can do as well um i would just like to suggest that if we're gonna um have a deadline then we also need to have communication and an ad in the paper and something on the radio and more than just on our website to let folks know um and maybe even let um the uh staff at iup um, know that there is a deadline um, as they get students returning to campus. 
I think you're spot on, Mr. Tim. We can definitely do that, Ms. Lauer. Yeah, and we also, I mean, we have worked with local pediatricians office um, to also kind of let them know that, you know, our enrollment is down. Please help, you know, if you feel parents are in need of this, let them know that we have the program available. Mm -hmm. um, so we have done more than just, you know, the website and Facebook as well. Um, this, this is Walter. Uh, I, I wasn't opposing doing this. I think actually we should should do it. I just wanted to make sure that um, we weren't trying to compete with another district that's maybe struggling to attract uh, enough of their own students. That's all. That certainly makes sense. Um, um, so I think we can bring this to the board. You have a, a deadline of August 21st. Is there any reason for that? That some magic num date? It, it's not, Mr. Harley. It's just really a date that I thought would give us enough time to try and get kids enrolled. Then if we were opening it up to outside residents, um, give us time to let people know that and get them enrolled for the first day of school. And we also want to give our, like we said, like Jared said, our families enough time to make their consideration and their, their decision. So that's what we did. Okay. Well, it certainly makes sense to, uh, to explore this. I, I agree with Uta that uh, we need to get the word out. I find it surprising that uh, with everything that's going on, that we, we're not filling these slots up. Okay. I, I, sus I suspect that uh, there's some another dozen kids out there that don't, they don't know about it yet. Yep. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's move this ahead to the board, um, but to get an advertising uh, campaign going for it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, number six, we wanted to provide an opportunity for Mr. McElhinney and Mr. Heinrich to um, provide some clarification that uh, based on the questions from the Polar Garden Farm Exchange Program. And we just need to come to a conclusion because the decision is from, uh, for our partners. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Mr. McElhinney and Mr. Heinrich, and you guys can update the board on your findings. Thank you, sir. Um, I shared a letter with you from our partner in the foreign exchange program that provided some clarification to uh, what would happen if our the exchange students were here and there was an outbreak of COVID or a positive case of COVID among one of those students. Um, I know it wasn't extraordinarily detailed. Um, it was pretty much a, a brief overview. Um, but last time we spoke about this, you did want uh, there was a request for more clarification. Uh, so Mr. McKinney reached out to that organization and uh, that's what they sent us. So they need a decision by uh, by us soon um, so they can find different placements for these students if we are unable to accommodate. Um, but, you know, it's the decision is ours. It's or yours. It's, uh, it's, you know, given the situation, um, we understand the concerns and we also understand the desire to provide this opportunity for kids. So. Uh, Mr. McKinney, is there anything you want to add? Anything I missed? No, Mr. Heinrich, you, you covered it pretty well. Thank you. And Mr. McKinney, to make sure the committee's clear, last time we spoke, you said no no additional foreign exchange students, but you're well willing to work with the two that we previously authorized. Is that still correct, sir? That is correct, Mr. Vukovic, considering that these students were approved and their processes in place. Uh, the deadline to which Mr. Heinrich referred, the students are supposed to have their uh, visa meeting uh, on August 10th. So, Mr. Harley, what the, the, what the board should have to, has to decide is whether you're comfortable allowing these two students that are approved authorized pre-COVID or if you'd like to shut it down entirely. And there's some there's some good questions and concerns that are brought up about travel restrictions and whatnot. So uh, hopefully the clarification that was provided you, clear, you know, addresses some of that. But if not... We just need some direction so we can move forward. Kuta Senda, do you have anything on this? Um, yeah, I'm. It, this makes me really uncomfortable. Um, I think foreign exchange is a great opportunity, um, but for me, the risk is just too high. Um, you know, in the letter we received today, it said if the student tests positive, they'll be. If somebody in the family tests positive, they're going to relocate the student. Um, that makes absolutely no sense because a student's been exposed and they're supposed to be quarantined. Um, I'm just really concerned. Spain just recently opened its border up again. They could close again. It, it just, there's too many, there's so many unknowns and um, I just don't think it's a good idea. 
um, at this time. Cinda? Did you say Cinda, Tom? I did. Am I on your committee now? No, but you look like you want to say no. something. Well, you know I want to say something, but you've you've only opened it up to the committee so far. No, I haven't meant to. I, um, I apologize. The, the idea of having exchange students is absolutely wonderful, and it's absolutely important for the education of our students and the exchange students. But this is the first time we've ever had a pandemic, and I think it's totally impossible to even consider having foreign students come here and stay with families. Maybe they don't get sick, but what do you do if the foreign student gets sick? Oh, they, they go to the hospital? No, they're going to need to go home. They need to be with their parents. It's just the wrong time of, of the year or the wrong time in this pandemic to be traveling across the world to a, a different country, a different medical system, a different language, and away from families. So I, I cannot support this at all. Any committee members, Tammy? Any yeah, I, I realize how hard it is to get a visa and to get this program going and how much work they've already put into it. But, and I think it's a wonderful program. I fully support it. It's just, this is a wrong time. Um, I don't want anybody stranded here and I don't want anybody stranded anywhere else. They want to be with their family. You get sick, you want to be with your mom. I'm sorry. Even if you're 63. Um, so I'm, I'm against this right now. Any, any other comments? Um, I would like to support it, but it sounds like the committee is, uh, and the board is, um, going to recommend against it. Uh, Mike, you probably have to put it on the agenda, um, um, with a recommendation from the committee, not to, not to move it forward. But yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I could do that. And I can have reach out to the program coordinator tomorrow and make them aware of our decision. It has, look, it's not hurtful. It makes sense. We were walking through this. This is what the meeting's about. So we understand it completely. We'll, we'll be sure to communicate as such. Any objections? Okay, number seven, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to the non-agenda items. There's a lot of information that we thought it was important to bring up to the committee to make sure they understand where we're at, what we're doing. And just keep everyone on the same page as this is such a fluid case. Again, let me reiterate, our plan can change in a moment's notice. It's very fragile depending on the data, depending on what happens locally. But one thing we do want to spend some time is talking about our synchronous learning update efforts. We know that was important to some of the public. We know there's a need for that. And I got to tell you, quite frankly, our teachers will outperform any cyber school any day of the week. But this is one area that we needed to improve. And we, we're going to we put a team together to really focus on that and really develop that to make sure it meets our family's needs. With that said, I'd like to turn over to Mr. Heinrich to let you know about our next steps as we have a meeting this, uh, a meeting this week. Uh, combined of teachers and uh, administrators start really tackling this this topic of synchronized learning. Um, when I looked at the data on some of the surveys, we still see, I think, over a majority of families still want asynchronous opportunities, but there are some that do want synchronous, and that's the that's the moment we're going to have to meet as a team. With that said, Mr. Heimer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have a committee of 12 teachers and all the principals are invited to participate this Wednesday at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. And the goal of that committee is, is simple. There's three, there's three things. Number one, we wanna make sure we meet the needs of our families in this time. Number two, we wanna make sure that we're, we're agile. We're, you know, although we're hoping for the best, we need to be prepared for the worst. And the worst case scenario is we're open, then something happens and we have to close a little bit. Then we get to open back up and we close a little bit. And that inconsistency for these kids is terrible. Um, so we want something that it gives us the agility to be online one day, back in school the next day, online the day after that, and uh, try to be as seamless as possible. And then option three, we need to make sure that it doesn't cost our district anything and we're, and we're okay with the, uh, the contract and what's going on with the, the union. So we've invited 12 teachers, union leadership, and the uh, the principals all to attend to work through all the different options and what it would look like um, given a variety of scenarios that we've been asked to to explore so we're very confident that we're going to come up with a with a plan that meets the needs of most um, there are limits to what we can do and we're well aware of that but we're going to you know do our best to as mike says meet the moment and make sure that our kids you know have the flexibility and 
and uh, support that they need. That um, is all. Uh, the yes, survey results you were talking about, are those the new survey or the old survey? The new survey results, the early returns on the new survey results are still overwhelmingly traditional model. Uh, people want their kids to go back to school. Now there's only 549 responses so far, so it's early. Um, but most so, of the people, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay, were those emailed out to folks or are they just on the website? They were emailed to every family in the district. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, so overwhelming majority are traditional school. Um, asynchronous is still, I'm um, ahead of the synchronous model at this time. Robert, when did those go out? Last Thursday morning, sir. Um, Rob, did you guys ask for a read receipt on those? Uh, no, we asked for um, the, no, we did not ask for read receipts. We collected emails from everyone, but we did not ask for read receipts. Do you think we should do another blast to remind people? Well, I know that um, I look at my, regular email uh, about once every six weeks if I absolutely positively have to. So if you know that they at least read it, that would give you a heads up on people who have gone through their email and those who have just gone, well, I'll answer it later. So. When, when, when a read receipt only works um, um, in domain. That, that's the way email systems work. So like oh. if you send a Gmail to a Yahoo or a Hotmail or vice versa, um, you can't force a read receipt. No, you can't force it, but most people don't mind saying, yes, I've read it, if it's a different domain. Um, I regularly will respond, yes, I read it, go ahead, give them the read receipt, because it's not yep. that big of a deal. Ms. Blank, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll definitely look into that and see what can be done. If not, then we'll, we'll continue to over-communicate. That's something we can definitely look into. Um, I know we've gotten lots of updates. It might be helpful to title it something other than family update, August, whatever, like new survey, please respond. Or, you know, your input is needed or something that indicates like we need you to do something. Yep, we, we could do that as well. Yeah, yeah, that. Okay. Yep. That's all I have, sir. That's it. So the next steps will be just we're meeting Wednesday and we will, you know, be communicating out to the families again, you know, what that synchronous plan looks like. But that's that's where we are. Rob, Rob, this is Walter. Um, do you have any feel based on your last couple surveys uh, when you expect the, the bulk of the uh, responses to be? Um, I imagine it peaks at a certain point, then kind of tapers off. Um, you're saying you only had 500, so uh, will you expect by the end of this week to have that, uh, the bulk of the answers in, or, or do you have any idea on that? Well, we are, we have always, always planned to send out reminders later this week to make sure the families um, were aware that, that they were approaching a deadline for us, so, you know, or a guide date for us so that we have time to build the schedules. So it seems like they do come in in, in uh, bunches. When we first sent out the survey, you get a lot of responses. And when you send out the reminder, you get a lot of responses. So we'll send out one or two by the end of this week, make sure that we get as many as possible. And, and Rob, this, this could be one instance where we maybe send a text message to all of our families reminding them about the survey as well. Right now we've been doing email, but to everyone's point, we'll use maybe tomorrow we'll send a text message out saying, please check your email to complete the survey. So that'll be another avenue we pursue to help uh, increase uh, participation in the survey, sir. And can you all make sure that we've captured all of our incoming new students, kindergarten and above? Yes, ma'am. We made sure that we had the list added, uh, added to PowerSchool of all registered kindergartners, so they all been contacted. I don't know what, how much more we can do. Um, keep charging ahead and keep communicating, and maybe we can get a, get a thousand or so like we had before. So, anything else, Mike, on this? No, sir. That was just a simple update. If I can move on to number two, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, number two, if you click on the hyperlink for subletter A, all that is is a one-page overview of our health and safety plan that we already communicated 
um, via social media. We'll email it out to families. And it's just a quick one pager that we discussed at our last meeting to make families aware. So I think we met that moment. And then additionally, we're required uh, by PDE to make sure we over communicate via posters, informational infographics, informational handouts about some of our procedures, protocols, and whatnot. So if you click on those links, you'll see we created um, three that will be placed on each one of our main entry doors. Temperature checks, a do not enter sign if you meet certain conditions, and then our mask requirement. That way we have consistency across the district and consistency in our roles and expectations. Those are being made as we speak, um, and we'll put that on all the doors. And then lastly, we create another infographic that we just sent out today about town hall meetings. The principals have done an amazing job preparing videos that they'll send out on, on or about August 6th. And then on Monday or Tuesday of next week, we're going to do, they're going to do some town hall meetings to hopefully address any questions that the videos may not have um, clarified or issued. Now, if you say, why not just jump into town hall? Because there's so much information to go over. We thought the video was something practical and useful that families can hold on to and refer to at a later time. And then the town halls would be just used to address any clarification or anything that needs additional clarification rather than just a open free for all. We want to make sure we treat everyone with kindness and sensitivity. And we thought the video may, if we could be proactive enough, can address a lot of questions um, right out the gates there. So as you see, when you look at these items, these items, we are making the expectations and routines clear. We're being accessible, we're over communicating, and we're going to do the best we can to address everyone's concerns um, based on what we know at the current time, sir. Any comments? I think you can move on. I like, I like the graphics. So thanks for your work on those, Mike. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Can I move on to the next one, Mr. Um, the, hey. oh, there was just a question in the chat. I don't know if, if somebody is monitoring that. I'm all over it. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. So the next one, number three, uh, the flexibility waiver that the board approved. Um, at our last meeting, I want to provide some clarification. We still have to meet the 180 day, 990 and 900 hour requirement. But what it does is anytime we do at home, uh, if we're shut down, we have to do remote learning. Those hours are counted toward meeting those numbers. So it's just nothing more than a point of clarification as we still have to meet the requirement. But the work that we do at home is counting towards those times. We are required to PDE after we approve the, um, the, the, the formal, um, Amendment you guys that you addressed last week now to show and illustrate our time how that'll be met. So we're working on it internally, but I just want to provide clarification that the time at home will be counted to meet those hours. And I know that was good for our families, and they'll be glad to know that that's an option and that's a clarification that they needed to hear, sir. Okay, that doesn't require any board action, no, sir. It does not. No, I just wanted to make sure I over communicated and make sure I was clear to everyone. I think we can move on. Okay, uh, number four. Uh, we want to update the, the, the committee on athletics and extracurricular health, health and oversight, health and safety oversight team. They're doing an amazing job. They're going to talk to you about the plan implementation, PIAA meeting notes, the WIPIL's, um, what they're trying to do with athletics for the fall. And then what we did is uh, I think a board member asked, look, are you going to send any communication out to families about no spectators this fall based on the PIAA's ruling? So we have a sample letter ready to go for Mr. McElhaney and Mr. Lozanic explaining of that. So what I do, what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to Mr. Lozanic and to Mr. McElhaney. They can go over A and B and, um, and we can talk about letter C and C is ready to go once this committee approves it, reviews it, make sure we're on the same page. We can issue that tonight, early early tomorrow morning. With that said, Mr. McElhaney and Mr. Um, Lozanic. Thank you, Mr. Bukovic. Our uh, subcommittee met today academic ex extracurriculars and uh, i'd like to thank the members ms broad and ms lowry for uh, contributing extensively to uh review and some revisions with that we were able to go in and able to take a lot of the language so we can make things uh, consistent uh, make it also uh, succinct and uh, concise and then also there was an update uh, to the plan with driver's education and Mr. Sokol is ready to move on with that, to conduct his education meetings uh, with his students and to start planning uh, to uh, complete uh, the requirements uh, for those students that had, I think it was about an hour left of their driver's education experience, as well as to begin planning uh, for the upcoming sessions this fall. Uh, so we were able to go over that, reviewed that as well, 
And Mr. Lazanik uh, provided an update, which he's going to do here momentarily, from PIAA in, in Whitfield. Okay, thanks, Mr. McElhaney. Um, last Wednesday, the PIAA Board of Directors met. That was the, the meeting that we've all been waiting on to hear their thoughts on are we moving forward with fall sports or not. Uh, the Board of Directors of the PIAA voted 29-3 to 3 to move forward with fall sports. Uh, with the caveat that they are in contact with the governor's office and the Department of Health, and ultimately uh, they will the PIWA will follow whatever the governor, the administration tells them to uh, uh, tells them to do. Uh, so we are still, I would like to call it cautiously optimistic that that we are moving forward. Um, the uh, WPIL board of directors then met. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, the next day, and they. What another thing that PIAA did was they gave individual districts, which the WPL is District Seven, the ability to adjust start dates, adjust total maximum number of competitions, and the WPL decided to go with a a what what is called a hybrid option. Uh, in this hybrid option, uh, they adjusted the start dates for competitions. The practice dates uh, remain the same. So for football, the heat acclimation starts Monday, August 10th. Uh, all other fall sports have their first practice uh, legal practice date of Monday, August 17th. That is also when football can start an actual uh, practice with pads. Uh, unfortunately, part of the of the uh, of the plan that the WPL announced is they also limited. Well, they they moved ahead then the competition dates. Uh, for example, uh, football, soccer, volleyball cannot have a competition date uh, before September 14th. Uh, uh, the week before that, football can have a scrimmage. Golf and tennis can start as planned. Uh, the unfortunate part is they also uh, reduce the number of maximum contests that, that our athletic teams can have. Uh, soccer lost uh, a two from 18 matches down to 16. Volleyball lost four from 18 to 14 golf each of our golf teams will lose one match uh we lost three football games uh, cross country they reduced the number but uh coach kinner is under that number anyway so i am uh, in the process of, of redoing um redoing the beginning uh uh three weeks or so of our schedules with the other schools uh when Mr. McElhenney talks here in a, in a moment about the uh, no parents, I, I do want to say, and Mr. McElhenney, this may be news to you. I just uh, found out just very recently that the governor's office is re-looking into that, and they will have an, an, some sort of an announcement in the next few days on, on who can attend sporting events. And that's what I have. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Greg, what's the status of the uh, band, the marching band and the cheerleaders? Well, the, the marching band and the cheerleaders is a question that's being asked uh, by everybody, including me. Uh, I was in contact with the with Amy Schumann, the, the executive director of the WPIL. She, ex she told me to expect no guidance from the PIAA or the WPIAL on uh, – on on cheerleaders and and band uh we we discussed it briefly this morning in the subcommittee meeting uh i've been in contact with uh, our band director mr o'lear you know he knows the latest uh the latest that i have though is it was confirmed as we thought this morning that band and cheerleaders would count in our outside gathering limit of 250. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Harley, I, I expect, as I said this morning, in the in the coming days, as the dust settles, the individual athletic directors uh, from the schools to sit down and and start discussing what we can do. Um, you know, if that 250 limit is going to stay put, I uh, it might be prudent uh, to wait just to see what the the governor comes out with in a couple days. Uh, you know, like golf and tennis. Those matches uh, are also under the, the no parents. Now, those are off-campus uh, events, so it's hard for us to 
to police that if, if we can at all. Uh, so by moving the soccer, the volleyball, and the football uh, uh, moving it uh, back to September 14th, that does give us a little bit of time to, to address the, the issue of man cheerleaders and how we're going to break down the 250 uh, in, uh, gathering attendance. Would the uh, 200, if the football team goes off the field like they normally do, mm -hmm. um, would the, um, and the band comes on, would that, uh, is that additive or is that uh, distinct people in, in one place? That, that's a question that I can ask. I have not heard that one. I've never even thought to ask that one myself. But uh, I was always going on the, the assumption that the, the band is part of the 250 with the football team because it's going to be enclosed within our, you know, our, our fence. So when the band is in the stands, uh, along with the officials, the, the, the four-man crew for the chains, all of our trainers, the security we have to have there, and the administrators will all count as the 250 is the understanding I have now. Mike, this is, this is Walter. Um, I think I raised a question maybe in an email last week about the potential for, you know, I feel really bad about the parents whose, whose children will actually be playing some of these sports and raised a question about whether or not we couldn't video um, uh, uh, this uh, the games and um, either share them on our website or maybe work something out with the IUP TV station or with the radio station or something. Um, do we have any updates on on how that might work? Yeah, what we're doing, Mr. Schroth, is I got Greg in touch with a, uh, a buddy of mine who's an AD in another school district who has a cheaper alternative for live streaming events and games. And, and Greg reached out to them today, and they're playing phone tag. But we are looking at options to to do some remote broadcasting, live broadcasting of these events if um, families are not permitted in the stadium. So that's one thing we're looking at. Greg made an attempt today to call. The other outlets we were looking at were a little bit costly, in fact, too costly. But we think we have a cheaper alternative through, again, one of my friends who made me aware of a program. And Greg, is, would you much is – that, is that correct what I said, Greg? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I also, uh, within the last week, reached out to Render Broadcasting, Mike Burdick, and uh, asked him about the possibility of doing uh, – Soccer and, and volleyball is a community service. Of course, it will come down to a financial decision. And we also talked about it this morning at the subcommittee meeting. Uh, and in the, the feeling there was that, that you know, this, uh, while it's a possibility and we want the, you know, the, the parents to, to uh, have the best experience they can with our athletics, that, that we need to, to take it slow, make sure we know who can get into the facility, who can't. Uh, prioritizing, you know, depending on how much leeway we have, who can and who can't. So uh, this definitely, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, radio broadcasting or, or live streaming, it's definitely a work in progress right now. Greg, what's the, uh, what will be the policy when the people come and stand outside the fence? Well, Mr. McElhaney and I talked about that very briefly. And Mr. McElhaney, do you want to address that or, or, yeah, I, I can address that, Mr. Lozanic. You know, that's a real possibility. They go and stand uh, outside the, the games, at the fences, on the school property. You know, we're talking about using our school security to remind people that you cannot um, stand on school property because it would violate that order and it could jeopardize our programming and uh, that competition. So uh, we are working uh plan to work with Travis and, and our security and to see ways we can, which we can do that. We, what we plan to do is be able to communicate uh, very completely so that those expectations are, are understood. And we are, you know, anticipating news, um, whether it be PIAA, their governor's office, about what does this attendance with, uh, you know, spectators look like. Um, when you explore the, the video options, um, um, please um, keep in mind the minor sports too. They're very important to mm -hmm. the parents of those children. Um, I'm, I'm awfully puzzled with why, um, why, why no spectators can go to a tennis game that has uh, 12 kids playing. Um, 
it seems it seems like a seems like the two fifty number should be flexible on that. I can um, you, know, you have tennis and you have cross country that um, acres and acres between those people. So maybe we'll get a little more clarification from the state and from the PIAA, yep. um, and uh, off we go. Um, I'm also puzzled with why the 250 number is uh, in place when you have a stadium for 5,000. Um, it seems it seems unnecessarily low. But um, again, you know, I think what unless there's some objection, I think we'll just keep our our hand on this pulse and see what happens over the next few weeks. So Tom, I. I agree. I think we need to wait till we hear um, what might come out later on um, this week before we send out any communication. Um, we can also explore um, if media is permitted, which currently the way the PIAA document reads, it doesn't seem like they're included. Um, we can't. We may also want to reach out to um, IUP and see if there are students that might be interested and willing to. Um, do some of that um, broadcast video, whatever um, it's called. Um, and I apologize that that's not my field. I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, um, <laughs> except for that it is possible. Um, and then if we are going to allow media, we'll need to rework um, that document because currently media is in, in tier two. And the one thing that the PIAA document did stress is that we need to strictly adhere to our plan. So I think we need to be really clear on what that plan is and what our expectations are, because if we don't follow our plan, um, you know, we don't know what somebody is going to say as a result. But I certainly would hate for somebody to get sick and we didn't follow our plan and they can point to a specific event, and then um, that would just be a nightmare. Wait, does um, does uh, the high school have a video capacity that um, would be utilized for this? Mr. Harley, can you repeat that, please? I said, does a high school have any video capacity that could be utilized for uh, broadcasting these games? We were talking about that earlier. We do have a digital media productions class. Uh, we do have students in digital media productions two and three, but I know they are used extensively for taking pictures for the yearbook. I don't know if we have the capacity to dedicate student, those students also for uh, videotaping uh, the events, but that's something I can check with uh, Mr. Pushkar. Yeah, it, it, would make sense. it would make sense that we um, go the extra mile to get these things uh, videoed. If, if you're not going to let me watch my uh, daughter play tennis, then at least, at least you know, show me the film. Um, yeah. uh, Tom, I think part of the challenge right now is media is not included in who can be in attendance. And so we need to get clarification from PIAA as to what they mean and then move from there. I think um, uh, I agree. Uh, I would like to us to find a way to have parents be able to watch their kids. Um, absolutely. But I'm just really concerned that um, they're issuing guidelines and then we're trying to figure out how we can have media there when they haven't clarified that media is uh, able to be there. Uh, Uda, I understand. I understand that. My my concern is that um, they reevaluate their, their situation, and we only have three days to get it put together. Um, so my my question is uh, theoretical. What do we need? You know, what do we need to do? Who who's going to do it? If we're allowed to do it, I, I, I understand right. that from what you're telling. Well, I think we've come up with a list of different entities that could we could reach out to and, and talk to about it. So, um, I mean, I think we're trying to work on a plan. Yeah, yeah, I I, I understand that the, the media is forbidden, but uh, um, I would certainly like to have the technical and the manpower um, ready to go if they if they wave off of that. I, I I find it hard to believe that they're going to have contests and have no have no one there, no radio, no, <laughs> that's, that's hard to believe, but welcome to the pandemic. Um, Tom. Yes, Walter. Tom, yeah, I have a question for Wade um, or for Greg. Um, the soccer games, are they played on the artificial turf field um, or are they played on the, on the soccer field beside it? As many as we can now, the, the, the boys soccer team, at, at times, Coach Myers chooses Mr. Stroke, which he'd whether he'd play the, on the, the boys or the girls. 
um, or, or the, the, the grass or the turf. I'm so sorry. Um, but as far as the girls, I believe this year, we've been able to get them all on the turf with our scheduling. But I schedule them on for the turf if I can uh, and try to eliminate conflicts unless, uh, we, unless a coach asks them to play on the grass. Okay, and then my follow-up question to Wade is um, your security will be – the question came up about um, watching the game from outside the fence. Uh, my question is uh, there's a sidewalk up on 6th Street that's a public sidewalk, um, and you have a, actually a pretty good view of the entire uh, turf field from that public sidewalk. Um, just – just you know, I don't know whether our people can go up there and patrol that um, um, or not, but that may be one one way that uh, um, uh, there may be some spectators uh, that might cause uh, uh, a, a minor issue. Walter, if I can add to that, um, if you go out to White Township and uh, play a game of tennis, um, moving um, – Moving the public away from those fences that are watching is also going to be a, a, a problem. So we need to we need to address that too. Now, th those are good questions, Mr. Harley, and Mr. President. What we could do is work with the chief of police because there's going to be a clear line of what's our property and what's not our property, and let us look into that and see if we get some clarity. I, I have no doubt Greg can look into that with Mr. Travis and, and seek some clarity. But just be advised, we may be limited what we can and cannot do. Meaning, our grounds, our facility, we can handle public community sidewalks, there may be a different issue, but we can look into that and, and get clarity. And back to your question, Mr. President, I have no doubt by the end of the week, um, end of the week, early next week, Greg will have some information from the AD I put him in contact with as far as the streaming option, and we'll go from there. Okay, Mike, just, 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 just clarification, Mike. Um, the uh, football field is actually in the township, so I don't know that the chief of police, the borough chief, um, has much authority in that particular case, um, um, but the uh, uh, that would fall under the state police jurisdiction, I believe. Yes, sir. We could follow up with him. So, Mike, one of the things we might want to look at in our plan is just to clarify what space we actually control, um, where we can enforce some of these things, and other space that we don't control, we can set our expectations, but there's only so much we can do. Agreed. I have no doubt Mr. McElhaney and um, Mr. Lozana will have something for us uh, by the end of the week, if not sooner. Um, you might have to understand um, or one of the results of this is that our band won't be making away, away game trips. I think that's a logical conclusion, correct, Mr. Mr. Lozanic and Mr. McElhaney, if the two right. requirements in there? Right, right now, the way things look, I think that's a logical conclusion. Yes, and 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 Jason earlier and I have talked about that situation. He he fully understands that. That very well could be the possibility. Okay. Well, and, the, and we could and we could unilaterally you know, decide that that um, um, no no away bands at, in Indiana and our, we won't send ours to their schools. So, yes. Um, but, and again and again, we can wait on this a bit, but um, I think we need to get ready for it. I think it's a good point. It's a good question. Uh, depending on sizes of school bands and so forth, that most likely across the board, the, the home games, uh, the marching band cheerleaders would, would most likely want to be there. I think it would also help in as much as the travel. There, you know, it would be great to have those individuals at the games, but at the same time, if all the schools are agreeing that the home games are the places where you can showcase uh, the marching band and the cheerleaders, rather than watering down the home and away attendance might be more helpful. Okay, so we'll, we'll, leave, that, we'll leave that question go for a while longer. Yes, sir. And Mr. Hart, let me make sure I'm clear. We will not send a letter out about spectators, correct? We will wait and see what PLBA releases here in the next several days as that may change. So there will be no communication from us. Is that correct? I, I believe that's correct. Okay. And, and, until we know more, and, and and give PIAA a chance to rethink um, these vacant, uh, these massively vacant uh, stadiums. So no, I, I understand. I just want to make sure. If it's okay with you, sir, I'll move on to number five. That's fine. 
So one thing we thought the public would want to know, especially our families and parents, is how we plan on do social distancing in the cafeteria. So we, what each plant, what each building did, using a website that Ms. Uta Lowry provided to us, was create their own basic cafeteria layout to give families a visual of how they're going to do social distancing in the cafeteria. What I'd like to do, Mr. Harley, is give each building in the order it's listed on the agenda, uh, two to three minutes, five if they need, just to go over their plans for the cafeteria, because that's one thing. I think families are going to want to know and that we can address tonight. And I know, have no doubt the principals will be sure to include that in their video to families as well. But we want to make sure the committee is aware of what we're doing, what they're planning and what that looks like. So with that said, Mr. Harley, I'll turn it over to Mr. Springer and we'll just go in the order listed on the agenda if that's okay with you, sir. Okay, thanks, Mr. Vukovic. Um, so the East Pikes um, plan, first of all, I'd, I'd like to, to thank Ute uh, for providing us with that template. It really um, made things a little more uh, simpler for us to kind of plan out. Um, so all I did was I took my exi existing tables that I have at East Pike um, and then just get the dimensions of them um, and then the space that I currently have in the cafeteria and just start moving tables um, and chairs uh, so I can put um, 55 students in the cafeteria. Uh, those 55 students are all six feet apart from one another. Um, so with the class sizes being about 20, I can get about three classes in the cafeteria for lunch and that will leave um, one or two classes per grade level that will eat in their classrooms um, as well. And then they'll just rotate, um, taking turns being in the cafeteria. So not the same class is stuck in the classrooms all day, every day. Um, but that's really kind of the plan. It's um, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, I put, there's some arrows in there that show the traffic flow. Um, but that, that kind of does a free spike unless there are any um, specific questions in regards to um, what you see on the plan. So, Mr. Harley, if there's no questions for Mr. Springer, we'll move on to Ben Franklin. Yes, Mike, keep jog on for me. Is Ms. Urbani on the call? I know she was, but she may have some technical issues. I didn't know if she's still on or not. Why don't we wait for him? We'll come back. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Savajan at Horace Mann to explain what her plan looks like and what she's doing. Ms. Savajan? Yes, hopefully you can hear me. Hello, everybody. Um, so if you take a look at the template that Horace Mann has, it looks a lot like the Mirror Sister School, well, the other fourth and fifth grade space, which is Eisenhower. And that is because we have just about the same exact specs um, in square footage for each space and the same exact tables. So um, your eyes aren't playing tricks on you. But one of the things that um, we have a blessing to do is that we have about 220 students at you know, maximum next year, but we're watching the surveys and realizing we could have less and we're monitoring those numbers. But if you take a look at our diagrams, the blessing of this particular feature in this website that um, Ms. Lowry sent to us is that you can actually use the six feet distancing or else it all turns red. So if you look at how many students we could put into the CAF, we can do upwards, I think it's like 42, three times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three times seven, 21 times two is 42. However, the cool thing about Horace Mann is we have so many extra rooms that aren't being used and we actually have some personnel free to help supervise that. So our goal is to really utilize the outside space when we can, which you'll see this in our video. Our space is almost conducive to do that because we have an exterior door at the CAF, plus supervision available, plus we're teaching um, positive behavior interventions and supports and roping this into what compassion looks like and responsibility and respect looks like now in this day and age. But further, we have about up to seven rooms available to put students into and really five to six rooms just to make sure that we can spread. So um, Aaron and I, Aaron Eisenman, the principal of Eisenhower have been working really hand in hand that we can make our spaces mirror each other the best we can, giving fourth and fifth graders the similar opportunities, but also knowing in our two spaces, we have different rooms available. So if you have any questions for me, of course you can ask now, but also I've welcomed the community of Horace Man to call me and email me as their questions arise, so. Thank you. 
Okay. What well, we'll about Miss Eisenman? Miss Eisenman, if you want to give an overview of Ike's plan. Would you, if she can't can speak, we, we slow, yeah. there she goes. We can okay. hear you, yeah. I'm having a little trouble with the mic tonight. There seems to be some glitchy internet going on. Um, thank you. As Krista said, um, we are in mirror um, uh, as far as what we can offer as far as our space goes. I do have one less table than she does in the diagram, so that would be the only difference um, on the different diagrams. But um, we do plan to utilize eating outside as much as possible. Um, we measured like a beach towel. It's about six feet, so we could lay those out and kind of have the kids space between those and use those as a guide and work with those. Um, we are going to continue to um, have like I said we could have about one class per maybe um, in the cafeteria I do not have the extra rooms Krista has so what we would be doing is eating in the classroom but utilizing our paraprofessionals um, as supervision during that time and rotating the kids so different kids got to eat outside different kids got to eat in the cafeteria so they're not always stuck in the room that kind of thing so um, it's a pretty straightforward plan. I thank Krista um, for her um, help in working together on this, and um, thank you for your uh, guidelines and the um, tool, um, Mrs. Lowry. Any questions? No, I'm just glad that this is working. Um, I saw it somewhere and tried it, kind of taking a guess at a size of a room, and thought it was pretty easy, but wasn't really sure and figured, you know what, y'all are probably going to want to do something like this. So it's really nice that um, this free tool is actually um, doing what we need it to do. Okay. Mr. Harley, if there's nothing to hurt, I'll move on. And um, we'll, we'll turn over to the junior high. They are going to use a multiple them in high school and use, use multiple rooms in order to adhere to social distancing. So let's turn it over to Dr. Minnick and Mr. Edmondson and they can go over their plan as they did a, a wonderful job as well. Thanks, Mr. Vukovic. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Just thumbs up. I haven't turned my mic out tonight, but it seems to be going around. I want to thank uh, Ms. Lowry as well. Uh, Mr. Edmondson as well has been really key in uh, applying this useful tool. Uh, he's, he was working diligently on it. Um, we both went around and identified what really logical space to uh, facilitate our breakfast and lunch plans. Lunch in particular where we, where we have groups in, in the range of 240 or so students and we have to plan for the uh, possibility uh, that all kids will be coming back and anything um, other than that will be working in our favor in terms of uh, safe social distancing. So beginning with the cafeteria, uh, the diagram shows that uh, we're utilizing both the, the round tables that we've had, and we used to sit upwards of nine kids, sometimes 10 kids at those tables, and uh, we measured those out. And uh, if we sit four at a table and then space more tables out, uh, we're able to fit uh, a, a total of 49 kids in the cafeteria. Now you see the upper calf is on the right, the lower calf is on the left, and you'll see that there are rectangular tables on the lower calf, uh, and, and instead of the round tables with four at a table, we have uh, one student at each end, and we're able to ad ad adhere to the social distancing guidelines. Um, branching off into the gymnasium, um, the gym is going to be really key for us to uh, facilitate our lunch rotations with a full student body. Uh, those round tables, four, uh, rather six rows of four tables uh, across each row, as well as individual seats along the perimeter of the gym, along the, along the bleachers. If needed, we can fit uh, upwards of 112 students in the gym area. Uh, if needed, we can also utilize our library and the LGI. Uh, the library, we've been working pretty hard over the summer to reconfigure some of that space. And um, based on the arrangements of the tables and the seating, we believe we can fit 44 students in that space 
And that's utilizing uh, the round tables that uh, are along the lines of the bookshelves as you enter the, cat or the library. And then there, are, there was uh, an instructional space that we've designed this year a little differently than years past. And that's where we see all the rectangular tables. So if kids are seated, seated cat a corner at those rectangular tables, we can honor the six foot rule, which is why you see uh, the seating arrangement as, as, as it's designed on this uh, spreadsheet. And uh, the round tables are a little smaller than the ones we have in the cafeteria. So if, if students are just encouraged to pull their seat back a little bit from the table at both ends, we can, we can easily honor that six foot rule. If they're sitting right up against the table, it's just inside the six foot rule. So we'll have to be uh, diligent as far as communicating that um, with our students if we need to utilize the library. The last room that we identified is the large group instru instruction room, uh, also known as the LGI. Um, we, we went around the LGI and we measured if we place a student at every, uh, every not every other seat, but two seats in between every uh, seat that would be occupied by a student, uh, we can fit uh, an additional 34 students in our large group instruction room. So all four of those spaces combined gets us up into the ballpark of 240 students, which if we have all of our students come back, one of our classes, I believe it's our eighth grade class, is in that range. Um, again, I want, I want to thank Mr. Edmondson and invite him. If there's anything that, uh, that I've missed, Kevin, if you want to jump in and add anything, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but I think if, this, if, if, if the return to school occurs and we have a strong uh, a student body population in the school, we're going to be able to accommodate uh, them with safe social distancing in the lunch. Kevin, is there anything you'd like to add? No, nah, Dr. Minnick, yeah, you, you covered it really well. Thank you. I just want to real quickly take the opportunity. I know we have a long agenda, but I want to thank the entire board, you know, for giving me this opportunity uh, to represent and uh, to serve the uh, Indiana community. Uh, it's been a really smooth transition. Dr. Minnick and I have been working you know, around the clock, communicating well to make sure we're prepared for the start of the school year in any capacity that may look like. So again, real quickly, thank you so much to the entire board and the administration uh, for uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, now, you, you, you nailed it, Dr. Minnick. Uh, we also talked about figuring out a way to rotate this out, whether it's a homeroom alphabetically, so the same kids aren't in the gym, LGI, library, mm -hmm. to give them the opportunity to rotate it out so they're not always in the same space. Um, but uh, but other than that, uh, uh, well said, Dr. Medic. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that, Kevin. Are there any questions from uh, the committee members? Mike, on the uh, layout you did of the cafeteria, you used um, a lot of um, long, skinny tables. Yes, sir. Uh, would you be able to increase the capacity if you had the big, if you had more big round tables? I'm looking at those on the left side there. It looks like you could put another half dozen um, round tables in that same space and increase your population a good bit. Well, I think I think that's a fair question, and um, certainly that space allows us some flexibility to play around with it. We we don't we while while we don't have an unlimited supply of uh, the round tables, the round tables give us. Uh, four seats at a table, and they do take up a little more space, which would cut down on the uh, the open area we have for traffic. So we have to consider the flow of traffic, not only uh, in and out of the cafeteria and giving them uh, passable lanes and making it uh, practical for cleaning in between lunches. Um, we have to consider the traffic during the lunch when kids are uh, asked to uh, dispose of uh, uh, their food items too. So we, we may be able to fit a couple more in there to answer your question. Uh, we would we, we would probably just need to play around with it and, and see it in action uh, before deciding on what a, what a final plan would look like. I mean, and, and sometimes you just don't know until you get a full palette of uh, uh, participants in, in that space. Uh, either way, we would be trading those rectangular tables with the other round tables and uh, that, that would present the same problem perhaps in a different space. Mike, you know, um, I would encourage you that you know, if we need to buy six tables, um, that we purchase, the, we purchase the tables to maximize um, the usage of these rooms. 
So um, if, if you need if you need tables, ask me to do it for them. And, <laughs> um, you know, um, I I appreciate you being prudent, but um, um, you know, at some at some point, you know, it may it may make a difference. So so if you need something like that, then, then don't hesitate to bring it up and, and make it happen. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that support, and uh, we're we're going to take a look at that. And, and uh, um, if uh, if that seems if that seems like a, a better solution, we'll definitely jump on that. I appreciate the offer, Mike. Mike Vukovic, this is Walter. Yes, sir. Uh, under the circumstances, um, some of that COVID funding might be available to help with the purchase. Of the additional tables in order to comp, I think you could justify that fairly fairly well. I agree with Tom. Um, in order to maximize your efficiency here, uh, let's not let a half a dozen or a dozen tables get in the road from doing what needs to be. Absolutely, sir. I'll wait to hear from Dr. Mack and Mr. Edmondson, but I have no doubt they'll they'll double check and get back to me this week. And last but not least, we have Mr. Johnson and Mr. McElhaney, um to go over their plans real briefly, just to make sure, again, everyone's aware of how they plan on addressing social distancing in the cafeteria. And with that said, Mr. McElhaney and Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Vukovic. A uh, couple of things about which we can speak, uh, one of which is the, the draft or, the, excuse me, the plan. Uh, Mr. Harley, we have uh, a budding draftsman with us right now, Mr. Johnson. He can go over the, uh, the schemata for uh, both of our cafeteria eating areas. I think it included a 3D view as well. So something I'm sure you would appreciate. With that, let me first, first turn it over to Mr. Johnson. He did a, a yeoman's job on uh, developing this, these, these uh, diagrams. And I can talk about the procedures and uh, as well as uh, cleaning measures that, that we think are very important regarding not only social distancing, but our health and hygiene practices. So Mr. Johnson. Thanks, Mr. McElhaney. Um, <clears throat> we had, we went through our two places that we're planning on have students eat at. And, and the first one obviously was our cafeteria. But when you start to factor in social distancing, we went from, as you can see, having, you know, almost 300 students, 250 plus anyway, in that room to, now we're in a situation where when once social, dist social distancing is applied, we were left with about 70, I think 68 students was the, was the max that we could fit that we figured in, in there. Now um, that's for seating. There is room, as you can see in the bottom there where students will be walking through and entering to the right, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we get to the final diagram. Um, so what we needed then was a large place to have overflow for all of those students. So our uh, the majority of our students will be moving from the gymnasium through the steps to the far left, bottom left, and they will be moving from there down to our new gym where we have a large group of tables set up. And Randy, if you can pull that up, we'll talk about that. So when students enter the new gym, that's what they'll see. They see a lot of tables set up. Now, I will tell you, when I had first went through this process and seeing all these flat tables, I really thought to myself, man, that seems unfair that these kids have to sit at flat tables. And then it was kind of a comical scene, but me and and um, and Randy Fetterman and a, and a few other maintenance workers were actually down there making sure that we could fit everything in. And when we sat down, we actually found, you know, students are still able to communicate with their neighbors. Yes, they're six feet away, but it, it really doesn't feel as far away as you would think it would. Um, we even went as far to add in seating above the balcony um, up in the media area in the in the gymnasium, and uh, we can think we kind of were able to maximize seating. One of the things that happens when students enter in is we're asking students as they're going in to go to the farthest away tables, and that really includes students that have brought their own lunch too. They would really have an opportunity to kind of move down there um, to eliminate some of the traffic in the building and stay distanced from the students who are purchasing a lunch at school, but it also just allows students to kind of move in and out in, in the least intrusive way possible. You can kind of see it all come to life here in the third view um, that has them two put together. Um, you can see a lot of what's going on. You can see where the exits are. You can see where the doors are. Uh, I wasn't able to adequately raise up the balcony piece in the gymnasium, but the 
the five tables on this side of that are from the gymnasium and it kind of gives an illustration to what you should you'll be planning on seeing now they're zoomed in so it doesn't look like much but i promise you that there's six feet at least of distance between every one of those chairs and uh, i went through and, and and mr McElhaney helped me as well as we, and we counted all the tiles that were in there and and, and we made sure that we were we were good to go so that's what it'll look like and um and that kind of you know, and those are the two places that we'll be eating. We can hold 68 students in the top, um, 212 students down below. And um, that's pretty much what we typically have in our lunches. So, that, and that's and that's where we can go from there. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, also, if I could add, we're we'll seating outside of the cafeteria in case we have some overfill, uh, we can accommodate that setting. Uh, as Mr. Johnson mentioned, one of the things that, you know, the idea that we got about as far as uh, busing goes, we thought it'd be a very good practice, not only for our cafeterias, but for our classrooms, that if, you, if you're if you one of the first people to enter uh, those spaces, or in this instance, obtain a lunch or have a packed lunch, then you're moving away from the doors. And then when dismissal occurs, it'd be the reverse. Those who are closest to the doors then would proceed uh, out the door first. Now, one of the other considerations I spoke about was the importance of cleaning those tabletops and those chair surfaces. And we have to build in time to do that because of our transition time uh, between lunch periods is four minutes. So we had to build in some additional time. What we're gonna do is have our students in the cafeteria, um, in the upstairs cafeteria, and now the new gym cafeteria, they will be transitioning to the auditorium. Our auditorium holds 611 students. We can transition easily every other seat in the auditorium for the last few minutes of the lunch period, allowing our staff uh, and custodians to go in and wipe down those tables and wipe down those uh, chair surfaces. And then, of course, at the end of the period, those students then would transition to their next classes. Well, um, what we did is assign teacher supervision in the auditorium as well as on the hallways during this transition time. Um, students, uh, we also mark the floors uh, where the students will stand when they enter the cafeteria if they're obtaining their lunches, uh, it is six feet apart. Uh, and then if, as those students are lining up, they can uh, line up outside the cafeteria and down the hallway, uh, that's where they will wear their mask and continue to wear the mask when they practice six foot social distancing when they're standing in lines and then when they can only remove those masks when they are seated. Um, this is Walter. I have a question for both Wade and for uh, Mike Minnick. Given that you're using the gymnasiums um, as, as part of your cafeteria settings, does this mean that your phys ed programs and classes will be curtailed in, in those gymnasiums in order to account for the logistics of setting up the tables and chairs and then taking them back down again? So Mr. Schroth, at the senior high, we do have the fortune of having two gymnasiums, the auxiliary gym, a fitness center, and of course the, uh, the, um, the opportunity to be outside when you know, it, it's, it's feasible. Uh, we were able to do that. The old gym has a, a uh, divider, so it allows for two different classes. And additionally, um, there will always be a phys ed class that will be having health instruction uh, offsetting the other uh, phys ed classes. So there's a movement, there's opportunity to rotate that. Uh, we chose the new gym because um, of the ventilation. Uh, we were able to turn up the ventilation, the air exchange up to maximum, and uh, even open up those doors if need be um, to help with that air circulation. So we are okay as far as, um, you know, where those classes can schedule. Like I said, we have the fitness center, we have the new gym with the, or excuse me, the old gym with the divider, we have the auxiliary gym in, in the back of the old gym, and we also have outside instruction, which, you know, phys ed classes typically do during the months of September, early October. Mr. Schroth, uh, this is Mike, and uh, it's, that's an excellent question. We, as you know, we don't have a second gym, but we do have some, uh, flexibility and opportunities to be creative. Uh, weather permitting, we have the backfield for starters. Uh, that backfield is accessible from the locker rooms. Uh, if, weather, if this turns out to be uh, a prolonged uh, scenario uh, where we're getting into the winter months, uh, we also uh, can uh, 
reapportion where, where, we're, where we're putting some of these tables in order to close off at least part of our gym. We do have a retractable wall in the gym. So if, if need be, we can close off part of the gym and re reserve it for PE class. We also have the pool and we have uh, classrooms available where teachers also, our PE teachers uh, facilitate their uh, health lessons. So uh, while we haven't, we have not yet uh, considered all the uh, contingencies because we don't know how many students will be back, we know that we do have room for flexibility. So once we see what the uh, student enrollment in, in, our, in our school setting looks like, uh, we'll be able to better answer that. And obviously our, our intention will be to uh, provide space for our phys ed classes to, to go on uninterrupted. We, but we may need to utilize things like the outdoor space and the pool a little bit differently than we have in the past. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, Mr. Harley, what we'll do is you, you could tell the principal did an amazing job preparing for this, communicating it. That's gonna be a part of their, um, their videos and we'll send this information out to families. What I'll do is uh, I'll email Mr. Banis and she's not able to join us and I'll ask her to put her plan in writing for you um, by tomorrow so you're aware of it as well because we can no longer wait because at, at, as of Wednesday, Mr. Heinrich is moving to his team board with the synchronized learning uh, portion and the rest of our time is going to be dedicated to that. So I'll get that out to the rest of the group. And I just want to thank the principals for doing a, a nice job on mapping this out, using this tool wisely and being transparent with our families about what it looks like in a cafeteria. If that's okay with you, Mr. Harley, I'll move on to number six. Um, is the committee okay? Do we need anything from the committee? You good? Okay, Mike, move on. Yeah, number six is a result of the issue with, regarding corral. At the high school, the numbers are small enough that they need to. They can wear their mask and go in the auditorium and have social distancing well within place. But at the junior high, it's a lot more difficult because it's a required special for kids. So I got to applaud Dr. Minnick and Mr. Edmondson for working with their music teachers to come up with a solution that's going to have a, a, a substantial or smaller cost, but I think can go a long way in making sure we have a safe environment while still honoring um, the arts. So with that said, Mr. Uh, Dr. Minnick and Mr. Edmondson. Thank you, Mr. Vukovic. Um, and again, I'll, I'll invite uh, Kevin to jump in uh, whenever he sees fit. We, we, we have had the pleasure of uh, having such a, such a strong music department across our district. And um, we, we certainly want to do all that we can to uh, support these gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, in providing the programming. Mr. Vukovic is correct. We, we have some larger groups with uh, some of our ensembles. And um, given the uncertainty of uh, how many students may be uh, back in the traditional setting versus students who uh, choose one of the alternative offerings that we have, um, we asked um, uh, two, two of the, two of the uh, full time junior high music teachers, that being uh, Dr. Jason Rummel and Mr. Zach Karcher to just begin thinking about how can we uh, maintain our programming uh, for our students so that they can participate in ensembles, whether it be uh, choral or instrumental ensembles. And they, they came in and met with both Kevin and I and presented us with a program called Soundtrap. And essentially uh, for approximately $1,400 and change, we have somewhat of an insurance plan that we can maintain, um, whether it be asynchronous or synchronous um, learning opportunities in those larger group settings. So kids could, they could operate uh, either from home and, and collaborate making music with their classmates from a safe setting in their, in their you know, preferred home environment, or they could be, they could do it uh, in school working independently where the teachers can pull together individual recordings, making music and composing, which is really the essence of, uh, you know, what, what higher level achievement is all about is that creative thinking and collaboration. Alternatives to that type of music instruction would be focused more on music theory and music history. So the best, the best scenario is when we can encourage kids to collaborate and, um, and create. And this program provides the teachers a lot of flexibility, uh, whether, whether they're operating from a synchronous or an asynchronous or even the traditional setting. And, and it, this fee would uh, 
be it's like a subscription fee for up to 300 kids so we would be covered for what has traditionally been about the number of kids participating in our music program mr mr uh, edmondson is there anything i'm missing with that no no again you, you covered it very well dr minnick um it, it, again it's just it covers all our bases as far as kids still being able to sing but in a safe environment you know one-on-one um and it allows the teacher to bring them all together so whether they're face-to-face -face or virtual, they can have those discussions. It's almost like a coach watching the film of a game. And once all those pieces come together on that one screen, that coach can still provide instruction, you know, based on their individual singing, bringing everything together. So it just, it just checks off a lot of our boxes in a safe way. If I could add something, uh, Dr. Laird, uh, used this software program in the spring uh, quite su successfully for uh, presentations or for for uh, her ensembles. So um, just just saying that it's a tried and true, tried and tested program. And uh, thank Dr. Laird for you know showing that innovation early in the spring to do it. Wait, this is Tom. Um, my assumption then is that the high school already has this program. They do have the program. And we also have the offer. Yeah, we have the program. Okay. So, to, uh, so the, this would just be um, extending this, this software down to the junior high school. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Anything from the committee on this? Moving it, uh, I think we could recommend it moving forward. Any objection? Mike, go ahead. Okay, uh, number seven, I was asked to put together about some sort of plan of attack to create some um, community right. awareness regarding cyber charter schools. Mike, 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 before yeah. you jump in there, I see Kelly's back. Uh, oh. You want her to go over to school? Yeah, Kelly, uh, please, good call, Mr. Harley. Kelly, thanks for rejoining us. I know you had some technical difficulties, but we'd like to allow you um, two to five minutes to go over your cafeteria plan like each school did. So we'll, we'll defer to you, Mr. Banning. Okay, I'm so sorry. I actually um, came into the office. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what was happening, but um, you were able to see my uh, setup of the cafeteria. Ben Franklin is going to be able to fit 70 students in the cafeteria at once. Um, I hope my camera's still working. Am I okay? Yeah, Kelly, you're good. And they pulled up your table, your, your, your diagram for you. It looks good. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so it looks like we're going to be able to fit 70 students into the cafeteria at once. Um, in order to maximize the space, I am choosing to go with desks. The tables that we currently have are only 10 feet long. Um, it's I'm only able to maybe fit one child on each side. It's just not um, I've tried a lot of different scenarios. It's not working. So we're going with desks and then the overflow will be in the lobby area of Ben Franklin. I'm hoping to put packers in the lobby and um, buyers in the actual cafeteria. I'm really doing everything that I can possibly do to avoid um, not using our gymnasium. That's our second largest space in the building. And in order to give students some time to be able to um, be socially distanced enough to take off masks, I really would like to preserve that space. However, based on the um, information that we get from the survey, if we don't have enough students that are um, choosing um, any of the models that would allow for them to be out of school, then I may have to shut down my cafeteria. So that's my backup plan. And we, um, have a very similar space and the other um, model looks like it. We also have um, desks, desks that we'd be bringing into the gym. A um, lot of concerns there. I don't have water um, in the gym. I don't have water close to the gym. Um, so we would have to really do a lot of um, additional problem solving, but we'll get there if we have to. Um, but I'm really hopeful that we can stay in the cafeteria. Do you have any questions for me? And I'm sorry, I missed everybody else's presentation. I hope that that was enough information.
I think so. No questions? I don't think there's any questions. Mike? No. Okay. We'll move on. Um, number seven. What we wanted to do was to create some awareness in the community about cyber charters and the idea or the thought that some people think cyber schools are free um, is absolutely inaccurate and incorrect. The home district, as you know, is required to pay tuition. So for every non-special education student, we're paying up almost $16,000. And for every special education student, it's $31,000. And when you look at that, quite simply, Mr. Harley, what happens is school districts must raise property taxes, cut programs or services, or forego new investments in students in order to pay these costs. And what we makes it worse, sir, is we know it's flawed. Um, Stanford came out with a nice report that says they lose on average over 100 days in math and over 100 days in literacy. So I think what we need to do is create awareness that this system they have is flawed. It's not in the best interest of kids and no, and it cannot compete with the quality of our teachers that we have in the district. And I'm not trying to be nasty towards their teachers. I'm, not, I'm sure they're good people and they work hard, but I'll put this up out there. Our teachers have shown the ability to meet the moment. Our teachers have shown to be professional, to put the best interest kids first, and to get results. And that's what they do. Cyber education is not what it's all cracked up to be. The reform that's needed is long overdue. So what we did was we created, if you click on the links, we created two infographics for now. We're going to create another one tomorrow to make people aware of the costs associated with cyber. You're looking at almost three and a half, three point six million dollars in Indiana County being siphoned out of our our county and sent to cyber schools who are not invested in our community. You're looking at one million dollars being drained from um the Indiana Area School District, they can go back into improving our schools, investing in our programming. And you're looking across the state, if they were to do some simple common sense reform in the area of cyber education, you're looking at almost $300 million saving. So what we're trying to do here is really create awareness. And the last thing I did was I wrote an uh, op-ed piece for um, to be published in the, the Gazette to make sure families are aware of it. Because again, it's misleading when you hear the fancy promotional material and the fancy advertisement saying it's free. It's not free. And I want to make sure not only people know it's not free, but it's flawed and it's not productive. It's not as efficient. It's not as effective as what our teachers do on a daily basis. And we, what we want to do is create awareness because if we were to see the mass exodus to cyber school, then you're going to see teaching positions eliminated. You're going to see jobs go away. And then what's going to happen there is increasing class size, and that's not going to be in the best interest of anyone. So what we need to do is pull together and make sure we tell our story better because we have an amazing staff who do amazing things. Uh, can we get better in a lot of areas? Sure, we always can. But I will say this. I'm blessed to have one of the best teaching staffs in the country and we've shown our ability to meet that moment and now we have to educate people on what it looks like in the cyber school because again their fancy commercials their fancy brochures uh it's misleading if you ask me because the data just doesn't add up you tell me when they when they're losing about 100 over 100 days of instruction a year uh in cyber education when there's only 180 days of school put that in context and you tell me if it's worthwhile but here's the problem. They could come back to our school and you see a gap even being even further stretched and us having to close that gap. And it's quite difficult. And we're not going to run from that. We're going to own that. But what we think we need to do is make sure parents are aware and we educate them on the uh, options they have, not only here locally, but let them know what happens in these cyber schools and the benefit it is to come to our school. Because quite frankly, our teachers are invested in our community, our kids, and in our schools. And I can't say the same thing for cybers. In fact, we know they're not. Um, if you want to Google another story about cyber CEOs and how many are being investigated for fraud and wealth, uh, you saw Attorney, uh, Attorney General DePasquale re release a report on one cyber school with an $81 million general fund. You tell me if the system's not broken and how much more taxpayers' dollars can be utilized in more, more than ever in a better way than now. So our goal is to help increase awareness in that area, and that's exactly what we'll do. So hopefully the committee is supportive of the work the principals and I did is creating these information flyers as well as the op-ed we wrote, and then we'll try to get that placed in the uh, Indiana Gazette, sir. Mike, I really like this. Um, it clearly is branded for Indiana and for our district and our community. Um, so I think it'll speak to um, our families. Um, there are other um, districts in the county that have um, kind of repurposed an existing um, document that I think the first time I saw it, it was a school in, I want to say Georgia or somewhere, clearly not here. Um, and they've just kind of adjusted the graphic for um, their um, statistics, which is fine. And it gets the message out. But I think we're, um, this is a whole lot clearer about, well, so what does this mean for me as 
um, a family whose children go to the district or as a community member who is supporting the district. And, and Ms. Suta is absolutely right. I gotta tell you, Mr. Harley, go to PA Cyber's uh, website and you'll see that they have a waiting list now. So you're talking about several teachers having to be furloughed across the across the Commonwealth, numerous. As a result of this, they can't hire enough teachers for cyber education and people aren't aware of what they're getting into or the negative impact they can have on their child's education. So Ms. Uta is right. We have a responsibility to educate. We have a responsibility to make families aware. And if they so choose that, then we support them. But I do think we have a responsibility to make them aware of what they're getting themselves into and the impact it can have on just the whole entire community. Any other comments? Mike, I, I think we support um, moving these forward, getting these letters out, uh, getting this publicized. Um, um, so uh, I think you can do this without a board action. Yes, sir, absolutely. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on to number eight. Uh, Mr. Nevin, uh, a retired music teacher, and the district reached out to me. There was a trip for the high school, I believe, to go down to Orlando last year that was canceled as a result of COVID. They're having difficulty getting their refund. So he called me and asked me for a letter of support. If I were to write that letter and it would help them get that refund, it makes sense. These kids are being deprived of the money. They didn't go on the trip. It's not fair to charge them. So I'm just making a committee where, as long as there's no objections, let me reach out and work with Mr. Nevin and see what can be done to help get this money back for those kids who invested a lot of money. Uh, it's worth a shot. It, it, won't make, it won't take much of my time to do it, and I'd like to do it as long as the committee's okay with it. The committee's certainly okay with it, Mike. If, the, um, if, if this letter needs to come from the board or another letter from the board, we would certainly support that. Too. Uh, okay. All the funds that are raised for these band trips are uh, done by selling popcorn at football games and uh, and, and self-funding. So um, whatever we can do to help them uh, um, recoup some of all that money, we would certainly be anxious to do that okay um very good i, I think we may have a comment mr harley mr show three mr president are you trying to say something sir yeah yeah i i just want to reiterate what mike's uh what tom said uh that the board needs to write a separate letter or if you want to put my signature block uh, underneath yours or beside yours uh please whatever you think uh, is appropriate to to uh, send the strongest message no, the only thing I'll add, uh, and I apologize for not bringing this up in, under number seven, Mr. Harley, if you're okay with it by next week's policy and personnel committee meeting, I'd like to bring a draft letter from this board uh, through Ms. Lauer's committee that talks about cyber reform. There's rumors or draft legislation out there about putting a moratorium a hold on cyber costs right now or doing some sort of reform. I want to dig a little bit deeper into it, but maybe I'll write a letter on the board's behalf with regards to that as well, and we can send that to Rep Representative Struzzi. And uh, Senator Pittman as well, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the last thing I have for your consideration tonight is, uh, as a result of issuing the survey and, the, and having to do April, August fifth here in two days, um, we're going to have to do a lot of reengineering of our schedules, assignments, and where people are going to be placed. What we're going to ask the committee tonight is to go is the consideration to bring the counselors in if we're going to need more time. Miss Aaron oversees them, and Mr. Heinrich are working together on this. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Mr. Heinrich, followed by Miss Eisenman. They can go a little bit more detail. I just want to assure the committee if we bring them in, it's not it's not for nothing, right? There's a real need for it as far as scheduling adjustments, and there's going to be a need. So, Mr. Heinrich's microphone's not working, but Miss Eisenman, is there anything I missed? Um, I think it's a pretty straightforward request. It makes sense, and there's one of urgency here. Okay, um, I agree. You hit it really well, Mike. Um, I've been working with the counselors. They did come in for a half day, and we did work together on um, also, in addition to doing this, talking about scheduling things they'll have to do, um, working on um, lessons or uh, things that teachers can do to help, especially the elementary kids um, with um, wearing the masks and why it's important and those social stories that we need to be telling them through the SEL as well. So in addition to working on like the nuts and bolts of scheduling, they will really be doing some really good um, SEL work and those kinds of things and getting those lessons ready to go. We have each were assigned to, we've identified future ready, um, smart futures, things that they need to have done so that if we have to go online, the students will have those indicators in. So um, I think we just need to um, also um, 
work with the, if we're going to have synchronous learning, they need to be a part of that and understand how they fit into that as well. And they also, as, as Mr. Heinrich pointed out, um, it's going to be as needed because some of the schedules are going to have to be redone um, by hand. Any questions? Mike, Mike, yeah. this is Walter. Um, again, I would check with Jared. Um, you know, the, this additional time is a direct result of our response to the COVID and um, maybe some of that um, um, CARES Act money would, or some of the other funding source uh, um, might help uh, cover this cost uh, because, because of what's really driving it. Absolutely, sir. We can, we'll be sure to do that. Uh, Mr. Harley, that's all I have for this evening, sir. We went through a lot and I'll defer to you, sir. Do we have anything else with the good of the order? Frank, I think that wraps us up. Okay. Well, thank you for everyone's time this evening. I thought it was a great meeting. I'll be sure to we'll be sure to follow up on those action items and get things moving, sir. Okay. See you. Uh, see you next Monday. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.